the final video of the year. Not something I usually care about, as time is an irrelevant construct uh, when it comes to my videos. But uh, this time around, it feels different. A lot has happened this year for me, uh, for the better or for the worse, uh, mostly worse. I've started a second channel, uh, leveled up the main channel content and started dabbling in multi-game videos, which would have been really cool had it not been overshadowed by a thick and dark cloud. And despite a grocery list of physical issues and my fragile mental plaguing me all year round, I have now officially entered the adult life. And the 9 to 5 grind. <sighs> I hate it. I hate all of it. I hate the 9 to 5 schedule. I hate the tasks I'm given. And above all, I hate modernity. YouTube's now become an escape, a little glimmer of hope to escape it all. But the views have plummeted to its lowest point in 5 years thanks to the algo xing my videos before they can reach anybody. It's been a year I needed to reflect on, is what I'm trying to say. Taking the time to come up with a plan to work towards a better life. And thus, I decided to start working on the XD Gale of Darkness retrospective I promised y'all like <laughs> two years ago in an attempt to hit the algorithm. But then life gave me the first step I was looking for. Ending a garbage year on a high note. It's, uh, it's tough being thicker than a bowl of oatmeal sometimes. This is Mosalina, a hostile interpretation of the immersive sim, where nothing's planned, everything's possible, and you create your own win condition. This little funny looking sim was put together by none other than the wonderful stuffed wombat, the guy behind the weirdest, vibiest, coolest and most interesting game I've played these past couple of years in Producer 2021, a game I've beaten more often than I'd like to ever admit and uh, <laughs> have glazed in detail in this particular video. And uh, I, I'd do it again too. I don't care. <laughs> it's really more of the same with this one. Mosalina is simplistic in concept. And be the selection of 9 levels by simply touching these fruits and jumping in the mystical space hole. But uh, that doesn't make it any less addicting. All thanks to the randomization and sheer amount of freedom built onto a solid foundation of LOL XD it is doing the funny uh, type of mechanics. Every time you load up a run, you're assigned a random selection of 9 levels out of 120 as of writing this video, not even including the easy to access and use uh, workshop levels. Bro's been uh, pushing updates like crazy. Levels you can beat in any order. Death? 
out of resources. Okay. No problem. GG and go next. And thus you continue, hoping for some actual brain activity or a more useful set of tools uh, next time you roll the level. Yep, the tools at your disposal are also subject to Z randomization uh, while the selection of 9 levels is generated. After which the random selection of 9 tools is then once again randomized and narrowed down to about 3 for every attempt at any level. It is through the simple concept of randomization that every run manages to feel fresh and ultimately gives the game a lot of replay value, which complements the minimalistic approach of this game oh so fucking well. Like just look at this. The simplistic stage designs and the soothing, moving starry galaxy backdrops. Not going much further than crumbling platforms, spiky death triangles, and the holy stack of rockets. Shooting these hentai ass floppy tentacles, inflatable bamboo sticks and Mario bouncy mushrooms all over the place to reach uh, the fruities. Or not. Uh, mostly not. And uh, I liked it. The tools having a limited usage and being bound to a single effect just makes this game very easy to understand. What you see is what you get, and the level can be over within 20 seconds if you don't see the path to success. Digestible is the word I'm looking for. Digestible yet addicting. I uh, I cannot emphasize enough how much fun it is to come home from my shitty ass day job I fucking despise, to uh, then load up a Mosalina run. There is no lore or any difficult mechanic to get the hang of, it's just a funny little changing weapon hat guy uh, trying to use whatever he's given to uh, touch a bunch of fruit. Dead. Bro, there's like a fucking red in my house right now and it's creeping me the fuck out. <laughs> There's no carved pathway to success, hell a solution might not be possible at all, but you'll soon figure all of that out if you fuck around and find out. That uh, that legit could be an alternative title for this thing as the game to me isn't even about completing it, but about the process of experimentation to get there. The complete lack of predictability just makes it so that you sit down, look at what you've got and go over the most unorthodox ways to get the most usage out of it. The longer I played, the more stupid fucking ideas I got, to the point of self-boosting myself using these frogs redefining gravity to then redefine it again mid-air and uh, using fish to throw an obstacle off a level. Then, after a while, my giga brain gameplay uh, looked kinda like uh, this. The collision of the shapes is a little forgiving at times, but for the sake of making me feel better about my own capabilities, 
I uh, don't mind that in the slightest. It only contributes to that ecstatic and addicting feeling of getting away with something you're not supposed to. That feeling of breaking the rules and ignoring the intended solution. Except there isn't any. It's all up to you to create your own gameplay. It's wild how well this game works considering it's essentially a simple concept thrown into a randomized blender. It doesn't give a fuck about providing a polished experience for the consumer to consume, it's there to show you what games can be. Something to mess around with. Let this be a lesson for all those games with what I'd like to call a fake procedural and or random generation that are way too scared to change things up to the extent of eliminating a solution entirely. Mosalina shows it doesn't really matter. A situation like that is just whatever. Give up, reshuffle and try again. Sure, this randomization also means certain levels are much easier to clear than others, uh, given its layout and tools at your disposal, but I found the difficulty to be consistently satisfying, uh, nonetheless. Uh, the levels rarely look impossible enough to not give it a shot, and my confidence in solving the impossible only grew along the way, after doing just that in levels I uh, deemed impossible. When my out-of-pocket nonsense worked out against all expectations, I got the dopamine I've been missing for years, and when the easiest plan in the easiest level of all time failed horrendously, I uh, had the stupidest grin on my face. It's a win-win situation either way. Dying is fun. Winning is fun. Experimenting is addicting. Mosalina most certainly isn't the best game of all time or anything like it, but for about 5 bucks this is an absolute steal. Through simple mechanics, a galaxy worth of freedom and the truest form of randomization, it teaches you to stop caring about if something's beatable or has any meaning whatsoever. It shows there isn't always the need for clean, polished and curated bullshit if the ideas are good enough to drown out the flaws. It embraces those aspects of game design service level casuals would deem subpar quality to free up an enormous amount of freedom and creativity. Involving the player. And uh, that's why I love this game as much as I do. It isn't afraid to fail. Imperfection is perfection. Actual perfection is kinda cool too though. Cause uh, god damn. I didn't think I'd find another game of the year contender while playing one of the game of the year's uh, games of the year. Abscission is a Chozo Mythos inspired Lovecraftian adventure by some developer called Beyond Bullets, who's got zero games on record but has un undoubtedly dabbled in video games before, uh, considering how complete this adventure feels. How uh, all of this was made by pretty much one person, <laughs> it fucking baffles me beyond comprehension.
on a rainy and gloomy day, aka any other day in this game. Detective Will Stanhope is called in by Detective Emilia Luna to aid her in solving this fresh and mucho gory murder case. Serena Challoner, or what is left of her, is just hanging there. Menacing. Hollowed out, rib sticking out, her jaw dangling from its last point of contact. It turns out Luna called him in specifically rather than her actual partner because the bizarre scenery appears to be linked to a case Stanhope knows all too well. The Lascado case. And from here on out, Stanhope's quest for answers progressively gets worse, as he figures out the rope Serena was tied to is made of rubbing, uh, growing flesh, starts absolutely losing it, and eventually comes to figure out that he's up against a nauseating supernatural conspiracy that, that has infiltrated his inner layers long before he connects the dots. It's a disturbing and original take on the age-old story of an evil force threatening humanity as we all know it, crafted with so much care and attention to detail that I put 6 hours into this over 2 days to beat it start to finish. Which is rather atypical for me, as I usually play a game for 1-2 to two hours tops a day uh, to prevent monotony and repetitiveness unjustifiably swaying my opinion. But the plot and the way it's written is just really, really fucking good and voluptuous. God, I, I love using that word. Voluptuous when it comes to describing every single detail of every single event or object, shaping the characters and steering the plot towards its intended destination. Especially in indie games, especially especially made by a single person, the plot can very often uh, feel a bit clunky. There usually clearly is an angle of some sorts, but I find random and at times goofy as plot twists to be needed quite often uh, to get there. In a position it doesn't feel like the plot serves an angle, but a conclusion naturally flows out of it through internal consistency and logic, a trading random plot twist for shocking yet very much expected ones. It's just a game you really want to see through uh, to the end. Endings, actually, as there are a number of ways this thing can play out uh, based on your choices throughout the game. goes my last shimmer of hope. Abscission is a story driven, horror point and click investigation. To solve the mystery of the flash manifestation, you collect and combine evidence from the various rooms and areas and question any relevant individual about anything relevant, using one of four approaches. Shit only pops up for one of the so many questions you ask somebody, but people will remember how Stanhope spoke to them and respond accordingly when Stanhope's out of leads. Getting egoed by homeless Andy over here was completely deserved 
after kicking a man uh, while he was down. I loved quote-unquote reading people and making a well-considered decision on how to approach them and to get the most out of it uh, based on the information the dialogue up until that point uh, had given me. Still not entirely sure how much each and every individual conversation steered the plot and or locked me out of certain endings. But during what I deemed to be the most important choice, I was unable to save and reset after I had seen all of the available endings. Which uh, really sucks, considering this game works with multiple saves to presumably prevent <laughs> just that. But uh, it simply didn't allow me to open the menu. Really, man? What? The gameplay is hella fun though, and assists the plot uh, very well. Uh, right click describing whatever's in front of you, uh, left click to interact, and using logic and the last 5 brain cells I got left to connect the info I got into what I need. Directional guidance could use a little polishing though, as there's nothing in place to even give you a broad and mysterious clue, other than Stanhope's journal telling you a whole lot of nothing in regards to combining this receipt with a picture to unveil a new location. And spending 30 to 40 minutes of my 6 hour game time looking for items I needed that were hidden under my goddamn pointer wasn't exactly the most fun experience either. Like look at my clueless ass looking for this polaroid under the closet, hovering over it a billion times, not seeing the question mark to indirect pop up due to my pointer being an absolute fucking unit. It results in rather infrequent and excusable guesswork, but guesswork nonetheless. It doesn't help that clicking on and using inventory items is a little wonky at times either. Simply not selecting an item despite my best clicking efforts, having to click out of the menu to use it, making it disappear due to an environmental prompt overriding it. Yeah, it could be streamlined a little, I'll admit that much. But hey, at least Beyond Booleans changed the text from autoplaying to manual skipping though. So uh, shout out to you, and to freedom of reading. Calling this game stylish it would be an understatement. And the plot themes, build up and conclusion are well thought out and hella compelling. The characters are written to be strong and memorable personalities. I won't ever forget. And the point and click gameplay is engaging enough to assist all of their greatness. But it's the aesthetic and atmosphere that uh, left me perplexed in a way. Everything, everything about this game is absurd to me. There's just so many layers to all of this. I don't even know where to begin. It takes guts to go against everything that makes sense in 2023 and create an adventure right out of 1992. But to then execute it as well as this is a display of peak indie game development.
that is how the game starts you up. An introductory story told on what is essentially a freeze frame. And different sized wide outlined frames appearing one at a time. Visually assisting the sentences telling the next part of the story before freeze framing inside the large freeze frame and fading into the next. Guided by an eerie and ominous piano string heavy track. It's immersive from the moment you start the adventure and stays immersive through its world building and general atmosphere all throughout. On a macro level, this means rain pouring down all day every day, exacerbating the dark and uncomfortable vibe created by the choice of locations, assets and type of weirdos hanging around. On a micro level however, this means game building brilliance. The white outlined freeze frame storytelling is just one of the many micro details that make this game so fucking cool to me. It doesn't hide being inspired by the Trilby Chozo Mythos games, using its flavor of graphics and power green small text font, but expands on and, in my opinion, surpasses them. And the sheer amount of little details everywhere is nothing but admirable, with moths circling around light bulbs, and diverse household articles and posters and shit, and the well thought out blood splatter placements, all related to and painting a solid picture of what the area or person is supposed to be. Most of it being clickable and having a description as well, adequately conveying that aura of the poor man's trash apartment, the stale as hell library, and the creepy lunatic cult base. None of the areas feels remotely the same. In fact, they aren't the same, as the scenes and locations are brought to you via these different sized screens and perspectives. From a close up walk through Stanhope's office to being nothing but a mere dot in a hellish landscape. From a sense of depth in a backyard to a 2D side scroller factory. Wait! I know that reference. <laughs> it's cool as hell how the simple trick of narrowing down the screen while visiting the starlit gallery or during a phone call puts an emphasis on what's actually shown. Stanhope sitting at his desk. The rain falling down in the windows behind me. The loud as fuck phone call interrupting the vibe. I love the scene near the end where Stanhope's being all emo around a campfire in the bottom right corner. Going all like... Oh, all I want is happiness. My guy might look like he's about to cry. But his character portrait looks great though. Every single character has its own character portrait, moving eyes and mouth included. Again, a simple yet character enhancing feature that elevates this game's delivery, with their facial expressions emphasizing their general stance and attitude. Shit's just a neat little quality of life detail, and I believe it's all hand drawn too. From the portraits to the cutscenes to the sink and stand up hand close ups. And I'm gonna throw in a bit of a spoiler alert before showing y'all this. So uh, skip it right the fuck now if you intend on picking this up. But uh, these character close ups are beautiful. Uh, for real, for real. Look at fucking Abdullah's infected corpse. Or Stanhope giving up on life. Like goddamn man. Fuck modern realistic graphics and get the triple A million dollar bozos to work on something like this or Mosalina instead. I adore these two games because they stem from genuine passion 
uh, created by a dollar and a dream. They're two vastly different games, one minimalistic and imperfect, meant to provide freedom and enable the creative mind. The other, a linear, a micromanaged to the last pixel, otherworldly horror called adventure that blew my fucking mind through its fantastic writing and means by which it visually conveys and artistically expresses itself. Both hella enjoyable games that made me lose track of time, combined available for less than a Big Mac menu. Uh. It's like the billionth testament to how dope indie games have become over the years. Yet I still hear these fucking cocklords playing the same free AAA games that are copying one another and make noise about gaming being dead and still. It's funny. It's stupid. It's wrong. It's a little sad. But above all, it's an ill-informed garbage take I could rant about for hours on end. But today is not that day. Salina and Obsession have given me the video I wanted to end the year on, ending 2023 on a high note. A year where I've come to realize I dislike modernity through a job I fucking hate, and where YouTube has all but worked out. Recording my worst viewed video in over four years. Alongside a plethora of day ruining health issues I've been working on, but still haven't gotten any answers to. It's been, uh, it's been really tough to see through the thick darkness where seemingly nothing I've ever wished for is working out. Stuffed Wombat and Beyond Bullions have poured their heart and soul into Mosalina and Epsition for no other reason than hope, determination and believing their dream can come true. Which, in Mosalina's case, has happened to an extent. And that same fire has kept burning inside of me, despite it all. Growing stronger, the more setbacks I faced. I started a second channel for the sake of variety in between my 7 week main channel videos, as well as being able to cover more shit. I have kicked the quality of my writing, edits and thumbnails up a notch, and have decided to try out multi-game videos, as well as shooting my shot at the algorithm in the future, uh, while sticking as true to myself as possible. Though this video isn't exactly conform to all that. It's like <laughs> the niche of the niche. Uh, wasn't planned to be a video either, uh, but these games just impressed me far too much uh, to ignore them. It, uh... It would be a crime to do so. Next year might not be better. Maybe I still won't have a job I like. Maybe I still won't have the YouTube career I've always dreamt of.
Maybe I still won't ever feel healthy. But, um, I'm hella determined to at least try my damnedest uh, for a better life. And just like these two wonderful game devs dropping two of the coolest games I've played this year. As always with these videos, I hope it somehow reaches somebody willing to take my word for it and just pick them up. So I can at least do my part in helping them achieve their goals. Cause, uh, you know, hard and honest work. Overcoming the obstacles and the patience to withstand it all deserves to pay off. I'll see y'all next year.